Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our webinar, Working Together, Increasing Early Childhood Education Services for Homeless Children. My name is Matthew Aronson, and I am a co-lead on Youth Homelessness Strategy and Policy with the Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs, SNAPS, here at HUD. And I am also the moderator of our webinar. On behalf of our office, I would like to thank all of you guys for joining us today. Today's webinar is designed to explain the what, how, and why of birth to five educational services for homeless children and families. And we are lucky to have leading national experts presenting today, both from our federal partner, the Department of Health and Human Services, and from an amazing local practitioner. Before we get started with the presentation, I would like to make a couple of logistical announcements. Today's webinar will last one hour and is being recorded. The webinar recording and PowerPoint presentation will be posted next week on the One CPD Resource Exchange Training and Events page at the web address shown on your screen. The Find By box can be used to filter the hundreds of other training materials that are available. It will also be posted by our federal partner at HHS, and that website is also listed on the slide. A brief feedback survey on this webinar will be emailed directly to the email with which you registered for today's webinar. Participants are strongly encouraged to respond to the evaluation to inform the delivery of future webinars. Those are really important for us. This email will also include instructions to get credit for attending the webinar for those folks using HUD's learning management system. Due to the high number of participants, you are in listen-only mode. That means we will only be taking written questions, but it also means we limit the number of you know, emergency sirens, coughs, sneezes, and side conversations that everybody hears during the call. We will reserve time at the end of the webinar to answer your questions. And so please submit them using the Q&A pod that will appear shortly on the left side of your screen. Due to the high number of participants, there may be a slight delay in the advancement of slides, and we kindly ask for your patience. If you experience any other technical difficulties, please request assistance using the Q&A pod that will show on the left hand of your screen. Next, I'd like to walk through what we're going to cover and provide a little overview for today's webinar. First, we're going to talk about SNAP's connection to early care and education, why it's important for us at HUD. Then we're going to talk about the value of early care and education for young homeless children. We're going to speak about early childhood partners in your community and what they do. Then we're going to get to hear from our partner on the ground in a section of Partnership in Action from Champaign County, Illinois. We're going to talk a little bit about federal interagency efforts and national resources of interest. And finally, we're going to get to your questions and hopefully provide some answers. Today's webinar, two talented colleagues from the Department of Health and Human Services are going to join us. We have Kirsten Beigel, who is a Family and Community Partnership Specialist with the Office of Head Start in the Administration on Children's and Families. She has worked for ACF for 10 years and is a social worker by profession. Prior to her federal position, she worked with children and families in medical, child welfare, shelter, and educational settings. Very excited to have Kirsten with us. Min Lei is a program specialist with the Office of Child Care for the Administration of Children and Families. He is a member of the OCC Policy Division and has a particular focus on child care regulation and data, homeless policy, and continuity of care. Prior to joining OCC, he was a policy analyst and early literacy specialist for the DC Superintendent uh, of Education and has worked both in and out of the classroom for education organizations in DC and abroad. We are also both grateful and fortunate to have a local expert with us. Kathleen Liffick is a director for Champaign County Head Start based out of the County Regional Planning Commission, which is a government agency. She has a master's degree in education and an undergrad in business. She has been in the field of early childhood for 30 years and a Head Start director since 1990. She has also been a classroom teacher, a child care center director, and a child protection worker. Very excited to have her. As a last bit of housekeeping, we have some quick poll questions for everybody so we can figure out your knowledge and level of interest in early care and education. So hopefully you'll see some questions pop up on your screen. The first question, how familiar are you with early care and education? 
And the choices are very familiar, familiar, somewhat familiar, or not familiar. Question two, does your organization currently employ or participate in an early care and education strategy and policy? Yes, no, or not sure if you're not sure about it. And question three, relative to all your homeless service systems priorities, how important is early care and education? Very important, important, somewhat important, not important. So I see some folks are already clicking away. Please take a minute to, to read the questions and, and let us know what you think. All right, it looks like we've got a lot of people, so keep them coming in, but it seems like this is very important, which is super exciting. I'm glad we, uh, we put this together for folks. Uh, it seems like we have a bit of a mix of familiarity, kind of across the board. 36% very familiar, 26 familiar, 29% uh, almost somewhat familiar, a few folks not familiar at all. So I think there's still some good uh, ground to cover here. This is great. Um, and also that folks think this is um, important and that they currently employ or participate in this type of policy, so this is great. So we have about 56% say that their organization already employs or participates in uh, this kind of strategy and policy working on early care and education. So we've got some folks with some good experience, uh, a bit of a mix of, uh, of level of understanding, of familiarity, and everybody thinks this is important, or a lot of people think this is important. So very excited. Uh, I think we're, we're on good footing here. So as far as our next slide is concerned, before I hand the presentation over to the early childhood experts, and I want to make sure you get a lot of time to hear from them, I did want to take a moment to help make the connection between our office, the SNAPS office at HUD, and early care and education. I'm going to talk briefly about three important priorities, including opening doors, educational assurances, and what we consider to be mainstream resources. Much of the direction that our office has taken over the past few years and will take over the next several is guided by opening doors the federal strategic plan to prevent and homelessness. The plan has four goals, several objectives for each goal, best practices and promising strategies for meeting each of those objectives. And I would encourage anyone who has not already read it, including the 2012 amendment that focuses on education and unaccompanied homeless youth, uh, to check that out. You can find these easily at www.usich.gov. You can also find them through our 1CPD site that we mentioned before on a previous slide, or it's pretty easy actually to find by simply typing, typing opening doors into Google. I think it's one of the first things that come up. But I do want to mention that within goal three, which is highlighted on your screen, preventing and homelessness for families, youth, and children by 2020, there's an objective seven, improving health and stability, that directly addresses the gaps in prenatal and early childhood development and includes as improving access to early childhood development and education as an important strategy. And all of this is to say that according to our guiding document, without addressing early childhood development and education, we will not be able to fully meet our goal of preventing and ending homelessness. Second, we have educational assurances. At a statutory level, HUD requires that its grant recipients, both at the community level through the continuum of care, the COC, and at the project level, assure fair and equal access to public education for its participants. This includes a requirement to institute COC-wide policy and collaboration practices, and to have a policy and designated staff member at each organization to ensure that each student is covered. The statute includes all publicly provided educational services, which in turn includes early childhood education as well as primary and secondary ed. And so this is also important because it's tied to our statute. And finally, we have mainstream resources. Leveraging mainstream resources, which for our office means non-crisis, non-homeless service, um, services, it's now more important than ever. Given the current fiscal climate, which everybody on this call knows about, our funds are stretched about as thin as they can get, and so to provide comprehensive services as well as housing and basic case management, our grant recipients will need to reach out, form partnerships, access both the knowledge and physical resources offered by neighborhood providers. Who better to provide early care and child and education services uh, to advise on COC and project level planning, to conduct trainings or offer related services than the organizations in your community or within the state that already specialize in early childhood development. 
using these resources makes our programs more efficient, and as we will learn a lot in a moment, will improve the outcome for young children and families that we serve. And now it is with great pleasure that I get to turn the presentation over to Kirsten and Min from the Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you, Matt. This is Kirsten, and um, thanks to our partners at HUD, we're really happy that we got to join you all this afternoon, or morning, as the case could be. Um, I just wanted to take a second to say that I really um, appreciate the commitments that, that you all make to your communities and, and your states, and it's a real privilege to be able to talk with you. I personally, one of my favorite um, positions that I had was working in a, a domestic violence shelter and um, outreach program as a children's coordinator, so uh, I feel like I might not say that to many audiences, that that was one of my favorite jobs, but I feel like you probably get it. Um, so anyway, we're, we're really excited about uh, the next half hour, 40 minutes with you, and I'm going to, Min and I are going to do a little back and forth here, so turning it over to Min. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Yep, as, as Matt mentioned, thank you for the, um, the wonderful introduction. My name is Min Lay from the Office of Child Care. And since we got to see that live data from the polling, we saw that there's kind of a range of familiarity with early child education. We figured that we would start with some of the basics. Um, so we're going to cover just some of the, the basic research on why the first five years matter. Um, first bullet point, the first to five is a time of unparalleled growth, exclamation point. We're really excited about that. It's a, it's a big deal. Um, Brain development occurs most rapidly between birth and three years old, and that's an indisputable fact. By the time um, age three comes around, an infant's brain will develop billions of connections between neurons, which build the foundation for later brain development. And this, the increasingly complex skills that you build as you, you age are built upon that foundation, so those first two years are really important to, to set the stage for later, le later learning. Um, we're talking about how during early childhood the brain strengthens the connections that are being used. So it's not only the creation, but like really putting, putting the, um, making them stronger and longer lasting. When we're talking about early childhood, there are a lot of different things that come into play. Language and literacy, math and science, physical skills and physical health, creative arts, um, social studies, English language learning. But something that we really try to focus on as well to provide a comprehensive picture and a comprehensive range of services for the child is social-emotional learning. Um, I have a one-and-a-half-year-old. Anyone who has a young child knows that this is very important. When we talk about social intelligence, we're talking about emotional well-being, social confidence, which includes um, sharing, coping, comfort, safety, dealing with challenges, compassion, a sense of right and wrong, and trust. And these are all, um, they sound like soft skills, but at this, particularly at this age, this creates an environment which is very important for the child getting those other language skills and math skills and all that. So th those are really essential. Um, now I'm going to hand it back over to Kirsten to talk about the burden of risks. So the thing about um, early growth and development is that it's, it's highly robust. As you could see in the pictures on the previous slide, all that circuitry happening is just amazing. And, um, I get a little nerdy about it sometimes when I hang out with babies and, I, and I'm, I'm playing with them or doing interactive things with them and I imagine, I imagine all those synapses firing and it's, it's just amazing how much is happening um, in, those, in those months, those first months and in those first years. But even though it's highly robust in babies, infants and toddlers are you know, just primed for learning, they're also highly vulnerable, um, as you know. So thinking about risk, because, you know, we're going to be obviously talking more about homelessness and the impact of homelessness on young children. We know that a stronger foundation in early childhood results in more effective development later, right? And so on the flip side, a weaker um, foundation will put us behind. So, so children growing up in deep poverty um, with experiences in their families around violence or communities around violence, uh, mental illness, child abuse and neglect, um, substance abuse and families are really um, potentially in a position to be behind in their learning and development because those kinds of adverse experiences can have effects on, um, on the health and well-being of young children. So young children who face a lot of adversity, adversity or risks, if you prefer, can have um, a hard time dealing with the stress of these risks 
particularly when it's chronic and um, and there, you know, there are some accompanying factors such as uh, maybe a lack of nurturing relationships, uh, lack of safety going on. So um, repeated exposure to, to stress can really overwhelm the brain um, and the developing brain, which we refer often to this as toxic stress. And many of you may, uh, toxic stress is very hot right now in terms of the literature around early development in brain science. And so you may be quite familiar with this, some of you. Um, but essentially, the fight or flight part of the brain, when it gets really regularly active for kids, it kind of is, uh, is engaged when it doesn't need to be. And that has a really negative effect on the development of, uh, of the, the wiring or the circuitry or the synapses that you saw in the, in the earlier slide. So we know that not all young all homeless children experience this level of risk and adversity, right? So obviously family experiences really vary, but generally speaking, if um, young homeless children, and I think we know that around half of them are, are under age six, are particularly susceptible to the effects of toxic stress, it's usually related to the fact that their parents are obviously really stressed out. Um, and so services that address basic needs for parents can really help as you know. So we, just, we really want to avoid kids getting locked into stress responses because we know it's not good for their health and development. Um, and we know that thinking about this, um, the greatest achievement gap, uh, that it develops well before a child begins kindergarten, you know, we know that um, families who experience homelessness and poor families often have a lot in common in terms of some of the challenges that they're facing, right? So this achievement gap is, um, is probably quite similar. So as far as you know, families, who, children who are experiencing homelessness. So um, I know that from our own research in early Head Start that we actually see the achievement gap beginning around 18 months. So that's just something to keep in mind as well. So just to mention a few characteristics and needs of homeless families. Uh, we know that, and I, in, you know, a lot of this may be very familiar to you since you all are the experts on, on homelessness in your communities and states. Um, but you know, they usually are headed by a single parent. Oftentimes, that parent is female, late twenties, and there are frequent moves, and it's you know the situations are characterized by um, high mobility, and oftentimes not very strong social networks or social networks that have been kind of broken, um, but sometimes due to the chronic homelessness, higher rates of unemployment and, um, and substance abuse. So, so given that these are some of the uh, experiences of families with young children who are experiencing homelessness, we can think about, about uh, what these effects can be for kids. And we know that associated, you know, associated with poverty for young children, there may be, uh, you know, maybe, um, Children may be hungry. I know in our programs we serve, and I'll talk more about Head Start in a few minutes, but we serve um, oftentimes breakfast and lunch for kids, and uh, we try to focus programming in different ways. In the, we know that a lot of times kids come in on Monday really, really hungry. So we know that hunger is, is a factor. Um, thinking about health and mental health, we know that um, these are families with a lot of stress, as we talked about anxiety and sometimes depression, and a lot of times these mental health needs aren't met for families. So that also has effects on children. Family homelessness is highly linked to family separations that are related to child welfare involvement, so like foster care um, or uh, open cases with the child welfare system. So in these cases, there may be disrupted attachments for, for young children, uh, given the importance of relationships for learning and development, um, birth to three, this can be really uh, challenging and traumatic for, for babies, infants, and toddlers. There's also high rates of health problems for parents, as you know, and high, higher rates of health problems for children, and additional um, delay development. We see more developmental delays in young children who experience homelessness. And a, a lot of times, behavioral challenges or externalizing behavior, this is what we hear about a lot from teachers um, and people who spend a lot of time with young children is that their behavior is really challenging. So around the mobility, the loss of structure and routine um, obviously are not optimal for development and sometimes moving around a lot. Um, this is true for, for all kids of all ages, but that they, they may not be receiving what they need to learn and grow. Um, and 
sometimes there's sort of a myth out there that there isn't such a thing as sort of infant and toddler mental health and that, um, that infants and toddlers are not necessarily impacted by homelessness, and we know that that's not true. So I know this is a lot to take in and a little overwhelming. So I think we should probably shift our, um, our conversation over to thinking about uh, where the hope is and where the good work is. OK, so, um, so that, that'll be me talking. I, Kirsten gets to talk about the heavy hitting stuff, and I talk about the more optimistic stuff. We're talking about better outcomes for children. Um, as we mentioned, relationships at this age are really important. Um, that's where uh, most of the learning goes on, the interaction with the parents, with teachers. My favorite bit of research um, trivia is there's one study that shows that the child's relationship with the fir their first teacher correlates with their relationship to teachers going all the way through high school. So it's like if that first teacher is a positive experience, that creates a template that they use going into every other relationship with a teacher. And if you go in thinking it's going to be a teacher is a positive thing versus a negative thing, that really apparently has a strong effect on, on how you view teachers going forward. So personally, I think that that is about as good an argument as you can make for the importance of the early childhood teachers. Um, in the State of the Union, President Obama Sorry, I lost my place on my notes. He made an unprecedented commitment to early education. Um, if you look up the president's early learning initiative, you'll see that he has what is probably the most comprehensive early education plan in, as far as I know, I'll, I'll venture so far as to say um, in US history. <laughs> um, this comprehensive plan includes high quality preschool for all, growing the supply of early learning opportunities, which includes early Head Start, Head Start, and child care, and then also renewed commitment to home visiting. Um, one piece that I want to talk about a little bit more, as Matt mentioned in my bio, continuity of care is an area that I work on. And um, this is very important with highly mobile populations, which you know better than anyone else. Um, when you're talking about children in care situations, if they're moving around a lot, that's not only bad for or detrimental to family economic stability, but um, there's a lot of research showing that that has long-lasting implications for, for children. Um, there's attachment theory research that shows that children need to develop a level of trust in order to feel comfortable enough to explore and learn within their environment. So if they're constantly moving every couple weeks, every couple months, and they never develop that foundation of trust to venture into the, the play area and all that, then there's a good chance that they could go through all those early years of life without ever really engaging in their, in their environment, and that obviously has, has consequences. Um, the research shows that early that better educational development at the early age has effects lasting through much, much later grades. Um, we're talking a lot about in this webinar about improved partnerships. Um, and this is referring to partnerships at the federal level, at the state and local level, and then at the programmatic level as well. Matt mentioned opening doors before. Part of that initiative, Kirsten and I, with HHS, HUD, and a lot of other federal agencies are working together on an interagency work group for ending family homelessness. And that's looking at the specific issue and trying to leverage all the different federal resources available to provide that comprehensive safety net for families who are in the situation. So um, that's, that's at the federal level. And Kathleen Liffick, in a little bit, at the end of the presentation, she'll tell you about what this looks like on, at a local level on the ground. And, they have a wonderful way of like interweaving these different programs and creating that. When we say safety net, that's exactly what she's what she's doing. So I'm looking forward to hearing that part of the presentation. And with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Kirsten, who will tell us about Head Start. I'm looking forward to hearing about Kathleen's part of the presentation too. But before we do that, we're just going to give you a, a bit of an overview about Head Start and child care. I, I'm going to guess that a lot of you have heard of Head Start and may even know um, where the Head Starts or early Head Starts are in your community. Others of you maybe not so much. But um, the mission of Head Start is really about uh, school readiness. Most of our programs are Head Start. Um, and we have a smaller number of programs that are early Head Start. So early Head Start's birth to three, serving pregnant women and expecting dads. And Head Start is three to five-year-olds. We've got about 1,700, I think, grantees. Uh, 50,000 cent 50, centers uh, in or classrooms, sorry. And, you know, we have programs like in the remotest parts of Alaska, 
uh, 150 tribal programs have Head Starts. We have a Head Start program at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Uh, so Head Starts everywhere, and it's been around a long time. So we, the program was founded in 1965 as part of the War on Poverty. It's a federal to local program, so it's actually managed out of, the, out of Washington, D.C. We have regional offices who manage local programs. And what I wanted to just let you know a little bit about is the eligibility for the program. So you can kind of see the overlap and if you're working with families um, with young children you very well might want to consider Head Start or Early Head Start as an option for them. But uh, programs serve families with um, children birth to five who are, whose income levels meet federal poverty guidelines who are receiving public assistance. And then there's categorical eligibility, which basically means automatic eligibility without thinking about financial situations for foster children and homeless children. And we use that definition for um, determining homelessness as the same definition as the um, Department of Education's definition, the Kenny Vento definition of homelessness, which includes the doubled up. And as probably you all know that definition quite well. So um, basically, programs have to prioritize homeless families. And um, they have to, what they do is they come up with these selection criteria as a program and they make decisions about need. And, um, and because a lot of them have waiting lists, they have to kind of figure out how to prioritize on their waiting list. And homeless children are in a category of needing to be prioritized. So good for you to know that. Um, also good for you to know that programs uh, do community assessments every couple years, every five years actually. And they um, use that data. They should be kind of trying to figure out homelessness data and, um, and using that data to kind of figure out how they want to prioritize uh, homeless families in their communities. And um, there are some different service delivery approaches that programs use. So program could be a center-based, it could be a home-based, it could be some combination of both. We talk about Head Start and Early Head Start as a comprehensive services program for children. And basically what that means is, is that we have the early care and education component, which is really the center of, of of what the programs do, but there are a lot of other things that um, are part of early learning and development that we support in our programs as well. So nutrition services are available, and I already offer programs do like um, family style meals and use family use meal time as a you know way to um, further kind of support learning and development. And we have mental health consultants who work with teaching staff and families f for children who are having social emotional challenges. Uh, there are, of course, prenatal services and oral care. You can see the picture on the left-hand corner. Uh, children brush their teeth at Head Start and early Head Start programs every day. Um, and we also prioritize children with disabilities, so 10% of all uh, program enrollment should be children with disabilities. And we talk about Head Start and Early Head Start as a two-generational model. So um, basically what we mean by that is that we, uh, we focus on the needs of both children and families. And um, if you're familiar with Yuri Bronfenbrenner, who he, he basically talked a lot about theories around um, the ec ecological theories where thinking about children sort of nested in families and families nested in communities and supporting each of those um, kind of connections along the way. And, and that was sort of the vision of Head Start. So programs are really set up to support family well-being. There are staff who who, prov who do goal setting with families, who help families think about kind of where they want to be, what kinds of things they want to accomplish, and they set those goals together. And oftentimes the goals are child focused as well. And there are a lot of opportunities for parent development and adult development in Head Start, ranging from uh, parenting classes and supports to uh, parent leadership and involvement in decision making. You can see the lower hand picture there. That's a group of parents who are members of a policy council. All of our programs have a policy council, which is comprised of 50% parents who help to make decisions about the content and quality and character of their programs. Just wanted to show you a couple of statistics um, from our program report. You can see if you look from 2006 to 2007 and then take a five-year jump, um, you can see that we're serving a lot more homeless children and families. And, and the reason for this is because our 
our authorization or our act changed in 2007, and that's when we um, our eligibility changed so that we are prioritizing homeless children. And it's also probably because there's been an increase in homeless families. Unfortunately, if you look down on the third row there where it says number of families that found housing, you can see that um, we're definitely not keeping pace with the number of homeless families that we're serving. So in the first row there, you can see it really doubled and then didn't really, we are not actually helping families um, acquire or find housing anywhere near the rate that we are um, engaging them in our services. So if you'll all humor me here for a minute, I wanted to um, just check in with you. I, I wanted to do a poll, and if we could run the poll, um, basically, if you could take a minute, and I'll give you some silence in a second here, but which of the following values and beliefs would you say contribute to the mission, approach, or activities associated with your work? So essentially kind of read through the statements and see which ones you know, you feel like are principles perhaps that are part of the work you do every day in some facet. Still here, just going to give you a little more time. Well, thanks for weighing in. This is good. A lot of you are participating. So the first one, all children and families deserve to live in stable environments that are healthy and safe. It's a no-brainer. And, you know, essentially, these are all statements that I know that Head Start staff would say that are part of sort of their mission and, and thinking and principles. So I wanted to lay them out for you um, so we could kind of see what you have in common. And again, many of you may already have realized this through some of your local partnerships, but there's really a lot of overlap here. You, you're both you're both very much aligned with the coordination of community services to prevent and respond to incidents of homelessness. Looks like children should be in environments that support their learning and healthy development. Lots of, uh, lots of you weighed in on that one. So foundations for family success begin during pregnancy and continue through the first years of life. 64% is not really a low number, is it? Um, so, <laughs> but that is the lowest number we have here. So just looking at this, it just looks like you have a lot in common in terms of your values and beliefs and that. We know just from partnership work that aligning and sort of struggling with those kinds of values and partnerships is often um, some of the uh, most challenging work in the beginning, but the most important work to kind of set the foundation. Thanks, everybody. All right, I just want to... Um, offer up a few thoughts about getting started with Head Start. Many of you maybe already are started with Head Start. Uh, but the first thing you could do is just uh, Google the Head Start locator. It's on our website. And, um, and you can um, figure out what Head Start, early Head Start programs are in your local community. You can look those up in different ways. And I encourage you to invite uh, your local Head Start to your continuum of care meetings or your council meetings in your communities. Keep in mind that um, transportation may or may not be available. Head Start programs and early Head Start programs are not required to provide transportation. And also that, um, that these programs are not um, sort of you know, automatically available. There are waiting lists. Sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, we, we, uh, we basically fund enough enrollment slots in Head Start so, so that there, I think, is around 36% of the eligible population can, can receive Head Start. And um, early Head Start is a much smaller number. So all that to say, we really, we really um, I wish we had more availability than we do have. So, but that's something to keep in mind, because sometimes people find that frustrating, because it's like, wow, what a great resource. Really want to make a referral there. Oh, you know, there isn't a slot, but just keep in mind that programs are prioritizing these young children who are in homeless situations. And also that they do have to maintain full, full enrollment, so programs work really hard to keep their programs full. 
I think there's also, you know, lots of possibilities, and I um, wish we could hear more about some of the things that you have found in your possibilities, but look forward to hearing from Kathleen. But a few things we hear about are, you know, obviously people doing referrals and um, doing some agency planning and shared social services uh, since since that, it, there is an overlap there. Sometimes folks are co-locating staff, so having early childhood staff do some consulting or on-site work in shelters, maybe to enhance play spaces. Uh, sometimes um, we've had uh, just ways to reserve or sort of keep slots open for children who are homeless when programs have really designed their program programming that way. Um, there's also opportunities to coordinate family events for, um, you know, to support family literacy through library partnerships and that kind of thing. So, but let me stop and let's hear more about child care. Okay, thank you, thank you, Kirsten. Um, I'm going to provide an overview of our office, the Office of Child Care and the Child Care and Development Fund program. Um, something that I've learned over time by presenting with Kirsten in different places is that everyone knows Head Start. Not everyone knows child care. So, so I'm going to provide some of the basics. Um, we'll include the overview and then talk about family served and then talk a little bit about how CCF can serve the homeless population. So the Office of Child Care administers the Child Care and Development Fund, CCDF, which is a $5 billion block grant program that provides funding to states, territories, and tribes. So unlike Head Start, we're a block grant, so we are federal to state, whereas Head Start is federal to local. So there's a the difference there, and you'll see how that plays out in the policy in, in a little bit. Um, we are the primary federal funding source devoted to providing access to child care services and improving quality of child care. Um, I said it's a $5 billion grant. When you combine it with state match and other funding sources, that almost doubles. So there's about $10 billion out there going to these child care subsidies. Um, Similar to Head Start, OCC and CCF has, is also a two-generational ge model and has twin goals. The first is to promote self-sufficiency by making child care more affordable to low-income parents. And um, secondly, it's to foster healthy child development and school success by improving the quality of child care. So we're really helping the family establish a, a baseline of stability and also making sure that children are in high-quality programs to develop the foundation of, for later learning that we talked about earlier. Um, a little bit about the, the children and families that we serve. There is kind of a, um, a misconception that we are not, CCF doesn't serve the neediest families because of the intricacies of our eligibility policy. Um, from a federal perspective, you can serve up to 85% of the state medium income, which is around 250, 275% of the federal poverty level. But states set their, pol set their own individual eligibility level, which is usually closer to about 175 percent of the federal poverty level. I mean, yeah, of the federal poverty level. Um, so there's a lot of overlap between our programs and Head Start and, and probably a lot of your programs. Um, right now we serve 1.6 million children each month. When Again, when you combine that with other funding sources, that number rises to about 2.5 million. Um, I talked a little bit about our eligibility policies. 95% of our families, oh, sorry, going back one second, 60% of our families served are living at or below poverty, and 85% are considered low income. So we really are targeting the, the neediest families out there. 95% um, of our families are working or in a training or education program, and this is an important distinction because we define, a lot of people think of CCF as for working families, and that's true, but that also includes training or education, so that provides a little bit of a broader range that may come into play with your populations if someone has lost their job or they're in a training program, that they would also still be eligible for CCDF. Um, another important thing to notice about CCDF is it's not an entitlement. Um, so only an estimated one out of six, or so 17% of federally eligible children receive subsidies. So there's a lot of need out there and we're, we're doing our best. Um, one last point before I move on. CCDF, we were talking a lot about birth to five, but um, CCF also, you can serve school age children for after school care up to age 13, and if it's a child with special needs, that option of serving up to age 18, or through age 18. So um, just keep that in mind. 
So as I mentioned, CCDF is a block grant that's state or federal to state. So a little while ago, we, HHS put out a policy package talking about how states and Head Start programs and child care can increase services to the homeless population. And I'll provide the link to that a little bit later. But I'm going to go over some of the main policy levers that we identified that I think will probably be most relevant to, to your population and the work that you do. So states can choose to offer priority access to homeless families. Um, like I said, only one out of six families actually get a child care subsidy, so states have the option of prioritizing homeless families to, to, target, to target them for these subsidies. Um, they can allow for a period of job search, which we think is very important. If, you're on a child, if you have a child care subsidy and you lose your job and you automatically lose your child care subsidy, that's kind of like a double whammy right there, and that's going to make it that much harder to transition to a next job. So we're encouraging states to allow for a period of job search so that um, families have a little bit of a transition and some support there. States have the option of waiving co-payments for families at or below poverty level. Our regulations and our statute stipulate that states have to have a sliding fee scale in place for childcare, so families would pay a portion of the, the subsidy. But if they are at or below poverty, the state has the option of waiving that co-payment. So that's an additional burden that they can take off of the family. Um, something I think is also very important is states have the option of exempting housing assistance from income determination. As I say, thankfully most states do this. Um, the practical implication of this is that a family doesn't have to choose between housing stability and child care assistance. They don't have to worry about, oh, if I accept child care, then I might lose my housing assistance. Uh, like, we don't want to put families in that position of making that choice. So that's something that most states have in place already. And finally, States have the option of using grants or contracts to build supply for vulnerable populations. Um, one state that does this very well is Massachusetts, and what they do is they partner with organizations that specifically work with homeless families, and they ensure that there are a certain amount of slots available to that population. Ninety percent of CCS subsidies are offered through vouchers, where the family takes their voucher, or they get approved for a voucher, they find their child care provider, and then the money is allocated that way. Using grants or contracts allows states to work directly with the provider and have a longer lasting relationship, a more stable relationship and target towards not just homeless families, but um, in rural areas and just areas of the highest need. So that's something that we're also, also encouraging. Before we move on to, to Kathleen, there are two small points I wanted to make. One is that in our program, we require that every, or states and territories and tribes every two years have to submit a plan detailing how they're going to use their funds. Um, part of that process includes a public hearing where states have to solicit comment. So I think we're, you may have missed that for this round, but if you are interested in the program, then um, you should make sure to know when your public hearing is and you can go and provide comment and then states can take that into consideration when they're finalizing their plan. Secondly, um, we just released a notice of proposed rulemaking. It was the first time in 15 years that we've released new regulations. Um, they are in a public comment period right now that is open through August 5th. Um, we encourage everyone to, to go check it out. It's on our website. And to read it, it's um, 200 pages long, but it's, you know, take it, print it out, take it to the beach. It'll, it'll be good reading. Um, and we're trying to get as much comment as possible to make sure that the final product is um, as strong as it can be. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to Kathleen, who will tell you about what this actually looks like. Thank you, Min. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'll start with saying that we appreciate being on the webinar this afternoon and working with everybody who's been involved putting this together. My first three slides are about what we do in our program. Maybe something will click for someone in our audience to meet the early care and education needs of the families you serve. So what we do, we serve 540 children ages birth to five and pregnant moms. We have a lot of different ways of delivering our services in our program. We offer center-based services with part day and full day classrooms. We offer home visiting services. And we also have Head Start, early Head Start services in a number of family child care homes. For our full day classrooms, we combine funding from the state child care subsidy system, which Min was just talking about, a state board of education grant, 
and Head Start funding. Combining these different early childhood funding sources helps us meet the needs of low-income families when they enroll with our program and as their needs change. We have prioritized families uh, who are homeless in our program, as the Head Start legislation requires, but we, prior to 2009, did not have a program option specific for them. We had been participating on the Council for Service Providers to the Homeless. That's the title of our local continuum of care. And we had learned about the various participants and their programming for serving families who are homeless. Also on this council is a local emergency child care program and a United Way, Salvation Army, so a good mix of agencies that can serve families with young children. At the meetings, we were hearing from the providers like yourselves, and in particular, we learned about the Center for Women in Transition and what they do. At a, the same time, there was an expansion for Head Start, Early Head Start with the ARA funding, the stimulus funding, and we approached the Center for Women in Transition to develop a joint effort. We figured we could write into the grant application one caseload of eight children to serve those families at the Center for Women in Transition. So in the process of coming together around homeless infants and and toddlers and their families, we began our partnership with the Center for Women in Transition with the concrete task of working on the grant application. In the application, we had to provide a certain level of detail, how many children, where would the programming be, how many staff would be needed, those kinds of things. This developed into a collaboration for sharing resources, knowledge, and our work. During the startup period for the grant, we engaged in cross-training to learn more about, more about each other's programs, and we looked at the application and enrollment process so we could streamline the processes to minimize duplication of, that the families had to um, fill out paperwork or answer the same questions. Also during this phase, we modified the space for the Center for Women in Transition. They had been using for group time, so it would meet Head Start, early Head Start requirements. Using our partner's space, we did not need any transportation services for the children, so that was not a part we had to add money into our grant application. Further, with the parents on site, we did not need to license the space for childcare purposes. Although, as has been said, we do need to meet the Head Start performance standards and we ensure the same health and safety regulations as in our licensed buildings. We had identified the staffing plan during the grant application process. We had one staff member through the grant to provide the child development services, and the Center for Women in Transition had a staff person to help during the group times for these children that occurred twice a week. Center for Women in Transition also had space for our staff person to be on site, which was critical for the residents to get to know us and for building trust. The center staff provided our own staff insight on issues related to the confidential location, and we had discussion around the fact that not all the families at the center would be enrolling in our progr joint programming. So trust building with any family is always a process, but now our staff are part of the woodwork at the center, and it, we're already starting out on a good footing with any of the families that are interested in Head Start, early Head Start services. As mentioned before, all Head Start and early Head Start programs must provide child health, family support, and child development services. We use a curriculum that faces focuses on the infant or toddler's emerging skills. And twice 
a week, we have the children in group times. And during that time, the parent may be in counseling or training, taking care of family matters, or joining her child in the group activities. For health services, we need to ensure that children receive well baby or well child checks, immunizations, nutrition assessment, and dental services. We also have staff that focus on the parent and meeting her needs, permanent housing, job search, social services, her health issues. When we can, we also support fathers, although this does depend on what is safest for the family. Um, comprehensive services for these children and families are really critical. When a family moves or finds a job, we do our best to transfer that family to whichever option of our Head Start, Early Head Start program meets their needs at that point. Our staff member continues to visit or check with the family during that transition time. It's also important um, to ensure that continuity for the child and therefore supporting the success of the family's transition to its next step. So um, here we have a slide on the partnership benefits and challenges. Some of them, we have many, but here are those that we identified as uh, some of the biggest things that we saw both as benefits or those that were challenges. So we have the mandate to serve families who are homeless. And again, prior to this partnership, we had no specific option. Um, those families came into our classrooms and into our home-based services elsewhere in our program. But uh, both the Center for Women in Transition and we are serving families with high-risk circumstances. So it just made sense to join forces they had space, we had a grant, and uh, so then we were able to combine and leverage our services with each other and better serve our families. We feel very lucky in finding a great partner in the Center for Women in Transition. They have a similar philosophy and approach um, in regard to continuity of care and um, Again, putting resources together so we can serve uh, families in a more holistic way. Head Start programs have to maintain full enrollment. And this partnership, as I said, we have built-in recruitment and enrollment because the families are already there. We have training crossover. Um, the Center for Women in Transition provided our staff with domestic violence training, which helped us build our staff's skills. And we have the cost savings. Again, we were able to use their space for the group time, as well as our uh, staff member is on site there. We now have an option for families uh, who are enrolled in other parts of our program who may need transitional housing in some aspect of, of their development, which means that a family can stay in our program, their child can stay in our program, um, during a what might be a turbulent time for them. And we were able to offer the Center for Women in Transition benefits as well. We made improvements to their facility and their playground. We include their staff in our trainings on child development, health and safety procedures. And um, their parents, all of the parents at the center in our parent education activities. They can round out their services to the families there at the center with the child health and the family dental care that we're able to offer. And then because our staff member can follow families after they leave the center, then um, there's an aspect of they, the center is providing a total service package that extends even past the time that the families are with them. But of course, we did have challenges. And in the beginning, we needed to talk about that issue of confidentiality to ensure that we were supporting the safety for all the families at the center, not just those who were enrolled with us. And we needed to, the staff there and the families needed that level of insurance, assurance that we would be respectful of 
the safety and confidentiality policies and procedures there. In order to provide quality space, required for a Head Start, early Head Start classroom, we needed to make changes to the environment. So we talked about that and we put in those new doors, the flooring, some small things in the kitchen, other items for meeting health and safety factors. We also had to figure out that paperwork piece and the reporting piece so that, again, families weren't asking to duplicate answers on lots of pieces of paper. Additionally, we talked about the differences in what the Center for Women in Transition requires of families and what we are required to do for families. So we're required to meet families at whatever level of development they are, and sometimes our role was to serve as an advocate to the Center for Women in Transition for the family enrolled with us there at the center, or in turn facilitate or help the family understand that following the rules and policies at the center were very important, living in group setting and um, respecting rules um, are all part of the standard process wherever you are uh, at, at whatever point of your life you may be. And then another piece is that the constant enrollment and movement of families in and out of the program uh, that is a lot of work, but um, families who are moving in and out of the center, in and out of programming, those are the families in, with the greatest needs, and that's the kind of families we're required to serve. So uh, our, our partnership with the Center for Women in Transition um, really, really hones in on serving those families in our community. My last slide is about possible partners you could check out in your service area to help meet those needs uh, for early care and education. Kirsten's already talked about Head Start and locating Head Start programs in your community. And you may find a Head Start, you may find an Early Head Start, you may find a program that serves both Head Start and Early Head Start, as our program does. Um, you can also look on that National Office of Head Start site and just read in general about Head Start programming. So you're a little familiar with Head Start um, as the national program. Um, I would, if you haven't already, suggest that you are inviting your Head Start or Early Head Start in your community to join your community of care and perhaps talking about setting annual goals for, for addressing the needs of homeless children that you serve or that they serve and um, keeping in mind that homeless children are a priority for federal programming. Another um, aspect of Head Start, Early Head Start is the policy council that Kirsten spoke about earlier and community representatives are a component, um, are members of the council. Perhaps you might join um, and suggest you could join their local programs policy council. We also in other parts of our program are using the child care money. Um, but child care at some point may be a need for a family in your um, shelter or your, your homeless program. So inviting those child care providers to your continuum of care. Uh, asking your local resource and referral that I'm assuming would be uh, implementing the child care subsidy system in your community. Someone from, from that agency might join you on the continuum of care. Uh, so that you would know more about child care benefits for families. And then another piece we put together in our program is state pre-kindergarten funding. And many, many states have pre-kindergarten funding from their state legislature. So uh, that might be another group that you could ask to your continuum of care. And uh, the more you know about all of the programs in your community, then the better you can work on maybe making referrals to each other. If you um, want to start in 
to more cooperative programming of sharing resources for training for staff or the families. Um, those kinds of things are those first steps to a more collaborative partnership as we have with the Center for Women in Transition. So Kirsten, I'm giving it back to you now. Well, I'm, going to, I'm actually going to take it from here. This is Min again. Thank you, Kathleen, oh. for, for your information. That's a, for everyone on the line, that's a great example of how you can really leverage all the resources you have at your disposal to create a comprehensive program. We are running short on time, so we're going to kind of breeze through these next couple of slides. Um, bear with us. We're going to take a couple of questions if possible. But um, So we have a slide on partnership opportunities and a slide on resources. Those will all be available when this goes up on the web. Um, so feel free to check those out. We encourage you to, to read up as much as you want. Um, so we're going to move on to questions real quick. Um, so only a few came in. All right, so, so first of all, thank you guys, everybody, for, for, for listening in and, and for Min and Kirsten and Kathleen. That was fantastic. We do have a few questions. Uh, if you have to leave, we will be posting this online. Please go on to 1cpd.info. Uh, uh, check this out. We have mailing lists that you can sign up. For those willing to stay, we're going to stay on for about 10 more minutes uh, to try and get through uh, some of these questions. So the first one I think I can actually answer pretty quickly. We had a question, how will HUD enforce the HEARTH education provision? Uh, so this is statutory, and so this is available for monitoring at the local level. Anything statutory is something that HUD can monitor and that HUD field offices, when they go and do their monitoring, that they can monitor. We also capture this information on our applications and, uh, and hold folks accountable based on how they apply. So it is a factor in how you apply, and then it can be used uh, in monitoring because it is statutory. Uh, the second question, I think this is for Kirsten, and it reads, can you address issues of preparation from birth, from a birth mother where she is homeless and seriously mental, mentally ill or uh, is involved with substance abuse and deemed a danger to the child? Does that cause trauma, meaning the separation? So again, uh, can you address, I think this is for Kirsten, issues of, of um, uh, separ uh, separation from uh, the birth mother where she is homeless and uh, uh, severely mentally ill or suffering from substance abuse um, and deemed a danger to the child. Kirsten? Um, okay, so I'm a, I think what I understand the question to be is that, that the child is being separated from their mother who, who is using substances and struggling with mental illness and is there an is there a negative effect on the separation from the baby from from, from the baby yeah, to I from the mother? So. Is that right? I think so. I mean, what one of the things that I've learned from you know, I'm I'm not an expert on early childhood development, you, you know, even though <laughs> I was called that <laughs> by Matt, but I um I I what I've learned in terms of um, the literature around foster care and attachment and babies. Uh, the impacts of separations on infants and young children from their parents is that what's most important and critical in the early years is is that the baby is attaching to a caregiver, um, that that relationship is being maintained or a relationship is being maintained, that in those earliest years, that's the most important thing for, um, for a baby's ability to attach and develop and learn. So that's what I can say about that. I mean, that sounds like a really... Um, you know, it's a really challenging and heartbreaking uh, situation for both that me baby and that mom. But I mean, I have to assume that that's a, a child welfare situation as well in the question, but wasn't sure. Cool. Well, well thank you for taking a stab at that. Um, so a second question, and this one I think is more for men. So it's, where can I find research? based on the relationship with the first teacher. So uh, Min had brought up this great study. Uh, so where can folks find that? Um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have the reference to that study on, on me right now. I can look that up when I get back to my office. But I will say that one really good resource for a lot of early childhood development um, information is from Neurons to Neighborhoods. It's a really comprehensive study of a lot of the brain development, child development, every, pretty much everything you know, need to know about the brain and, and the early years. So um, I'll work with Matt afterwards and see if I can get the reference to that particular study, but from Neurons to Neighborhoods is a great place to start. 
Excellent. And then I think this one might be easy for men. I think this was, uh, what is the meaning of OCC? Can you define that again for us? Um, let me go back to my office and see if I can find the same. <laughs> <laughs> OCC stands for the Office of Child Care. <laughs> And then a question for folks, does anybody, and I don't know if folks are familiar with this, we had a question about HUD Citicorp kiosk computers in libraries in Southern California. Is anybody familiar with this implementation? I think we might have to research this. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. Okay, so we'll have to do some looking into Southern California's implementation of kiosks for, for information um, and sharing. And then I think so far that may be all the questions that we have. Um, if anybody has any additional questions, they can uh, submit them. So if you go actually a couple slides from here, we'll actually provide you with Min and Kirsten's, uh, there we go, uh, email address. So you can email them directly. You can email Kathleen if you have uh, questions about her program and how it's been implemented. You can also, from as a baseline of information, go to Head Start's website, which is also listed on the slide, as well as Office of Child Care. And finally, one pitch on the next slide for HUD is if you go to 1cpd.info, uh, we have mailing lists. If you sign up for our mailing list, there are several of them. They're split up by categories. Some have to do with our continuum of care program, some with our emergency solutions grant program, some just with our data. What you can do is you can sign up for one or many, and you will get information on any updates that we have, whether it's technical in nature, having to do with uh, technical assistance, having to do with grants. Uh, you can also find information on future webinars. So we'd like to thank everybody for participating. Uh, we especially thank uh, our friends at, at uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. Wonderful they were able to join and share all the information they did with us. I hope this isn't the last time. And then to Kathleen, you were wonderful. I uh, really appreciate the local perspective. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. We hope to see you uh, and hear from you next time. Thank you. Thank you.